Your body can survive without food for weeks, but most people panic after missing lunch. Why do some people thrive on intermittent fasting, while others feel like they're dying after 12 hours without a snack? Today, I'll explain what really happens to your body when you fast like you're 5 years old. And by the end, you'll understand why fasting works like magic for some people and feels like torture for others. When you stop eating, your body doesn't just sit there waiting for the next meal. It immediately starts making dramatic changes, switching from one energy source to another. Your body has two primary fuel sources, quick access sugar stored as glycogen and long-term storage in the form of body fat. The first thing that happens when you fast is your body burns through its glycogen stores. This is basically sugar that's been packaged up and stored in your liver and muscles for easy access. Your body can tap into this glycogen supply for about 12 to 24 hours, depending on how much you had stored and how active you are. During these first few hours of fasting, your blood sugar levels start to drop. Your liver starts breaking down that stored glycogen and releasing it as glucose into your bloodstream to keep your blood sugar stable. This happens automatically, without you even knowing it. But here's where the real magic happens. After about 12 to 16 hours without food, your glycogen stores start running low. Your body realizes it needs to switch gears, so it starts producing something called ketones. These are made when your liver breaks down fat for fuel instead of relying on sugar. This metabolic switch is called ketosis, and it's your body's backup energy system kicking in. This is when many people start feeling different during a fast. Some feel energized and mentally sharp, while others feel tired and cranky. The difference often comes down to how well their bodies can make this metabolic switch. People who already eat fewer carbs regularly or exercise often tend to transition into ketosis more smoothly. Their bodies are already familiar with using fat as fuel. Meanwhile, people whose bodies are used to running on sugar all the time might struggle with this transition. They might experience what's often called the keto flu during longer fasts, feeling foggy, tired, or irritable as their bodies learn to efficiently burn fat instead of sugar. This isn't actual illness, it's just metabolic growing pains. Now here's what most people don't realize. Your hormone levels start shifting in remarkable ways during a fast. Insulin, the hormone that helps your cells absorb sugar from your blood, drops significantly. Lower insulin levels make it easier for your body to access stored fat for energy. This is one of the primary mechanisms behind why fasting can lead to fat loss. At the same time, other hormones start ramping up. Growth hormone can increase dramatically during fasting, sometimes by 300 to 500 percent. This hormone helps preserve muscle mass and promotes fat burning. Your body also increases production of norepinephrine, a hormone that helps mobilize fat stores and can make you feel more alert and focused. This is why some people report feeling wired or energized during fasts. They're literally running on stress hormones. Around the 16 to 24 hour mark, something called autophagy kicks into high gear. This is your body's cellular cleanup process. During autophagy, your cells start breaking down and recycling damaged proteins and cellular components. Your body is essentially taking advantage of the break from digesting food to perform maintenance at the cellular level. This process is one reason why researchers are so interested in the potential health benefits of fasting. Some studies suggest that autophagy might help protect against age-related diseases and even extend lifespan, though most of this research is still in early stages and primarily done in animals. The human data is promising but limited. Your brain also adapts to fasting in interesting ways. After the initial adjustment period, many people report feeling mentally sharper during fasts. This might be because ketones are actually a very efficient fuel for brain cells. Some researchers think this mental clarity during fasting might be an evolutionary adaptation that helped our ancestors stay focused and alert when food was scarce. Being sharp and motivated to find food when you're hungry makes evolutionary sense. But here's the truth that fasting influencers don't always mention. Your genetics play a huge role in how well you handle going without food. Some people have genetic variations that make them more efficient at switching between fuel sources, while others are naturally better at maintaining stable blood sugar levels during fasting. If your parents or grandparents could skip meals without issue, you're more likely to tolerate fasting well. If they got hangry and shaky without regular food, you probably will too.
Your metabolic history matters just as much as genetics. If you've spent years eating frequent meals and snacks, especially ones high in refined carbs and sugar, your body might be out of practice when it comes to burning fat efficiently. These people often struggle more with fasting initially because their metabolic machinery for fat burning hasn't been used much. It's not broken, it's just rusty. Sleep quality and stress levels dramatically affect how your body responds to fasting. Poor sleep messes with hormones like cortisol and ghrelin that regulate hunger and metabolism. High stress levels can make fasting feel much more difficult because stress hormones interfere with the metabolic switch to fat burning. If you're chronically stressed or sleep deprived, adding fasting to the mix might just make everything worse. Here's something that'll surprise you. Your gut bacteria also influence how you respond to fasting. Different bacterial populations in your digestive system affect everything from how you process nutrients to how stable your blood sugar levels remain during fasting periods. People with more diverse gut microbiomes often report easier fasting experiences though the exact mechanisms are still being researched. Women often have different fasting experiences than men, largely due to hormonal differences. Female hormones are more sensitive to changes in energy availability, which makes sense from an evolutionary perspective, since the female body needs to prioritize reproductive function. Some women find that very long fasts or frequent fasting can disrupt their menstrual cycles or cause other hormonal issues. This doesn't mean women can't fast, but they might need to be more cautious about fasting duration and frequency. The timing of when you fast also matters more than most people realize. Some people do better with morning fasts, skipping breakfast and eating their first meal at lunch. Others prefer evening fasts, stopping eating after an early dinner. This often comes down to your natural circadian rhythms and when your body is most insulin sensitive. Morning people often do better skipping dinner, while night owls might prefer skipping breakfast. Your activity level during fasting makes a big difference too. Light exercise like walking can actually make fasting easier by helping your body switch to fat burning more efficiently. But intense workouts during long fasts can be challenging, especially if your body isn't well adapted to using fat for fuel. Trying to hit a personal record at the gym while 20 hours into a fast is a recipe for disappointment and possibly injury. Age is another factor that affects fasting response. Younger people often adapt to fasting more easily, while older adults might need to be more cautious, especially if they have underlying health conditions or take medications that affect blood sugar. If you're over 60 or have any metabolic conditions, consulting a doctor before starting any fasting regimen isn't just recommended, it's essential. Now here's where things get complicated. The length and frequency of your fast determine what happens in your body. Short, intermittent fasts of 12 to 16 hours mainly trigger the initial metabolic switch and some autophagy. Longer fasts of 24 hours or more can trigger more dramatic changes in hormone levels and cellular repair processes. But longer doesn't always mean better. Some people do great with daily 16-hour fasts, but crash hard during 24-hour fasts. Some people find that easing into fasting gradually works better than jumping straight into long fasting periods. Starting with a 12-hour overnight fast and gradually extending it allows your body to adapt more comfortably to using fat for fuel. This slow progression also helps you figure out your personal tolerance without the misery of diving headfirst into an extended fast you're not ready for. The foods you eat when you break your fast can also affect how well your body adapts to fasting over time. Breaking a fast with highly processed foods or lots of sugar can make the next fasting period more difficult because it reinforces your body's dependence on sugar for fuel. Breaking a fast with protein, healthy fats, and fiber-rich foods tends to make subsequent fasts easier. Hydration becomes extra important during fasting because you're not getting water from food. Most people don't realize that food provides about 20% of their daily water intake. Dehydration can make fasting symptoms like headaches and fatigue much worse. Adding a pinch of salt to your water can help maintain electrolyte balance during longer fasts, especially if you're also exercising. Here's what the fasting community often gets wrong. They treat it like a one-size-fits-all solution, when the reality is far more nuanced. Some people genuinely thrive on intermittent fasting. Their bodies adapt quickly, they feel energized, and they lose fat while maintaining muscle. For these people, fasting is a game changer, but other people feel terrible on fasting protocols no matter how long they stick with it. They're constantly hungry, 
their energy crashes, their sleep suffers, and they obsess about food all day. For these people, fasting isn't a solution, it's torture. And that's okay. Not every dietary approach works for every person. The problem is when fasting advocates insist that anyone who struggles just isn't doing it right or needs to push through longer. Sometimes your body is telling you something important when it responds poorly to fasting. Sometimes the best dietary approach is the one that doesn't make you miserable. There's also the psychological component that gets overlooked. Some people develop unhealthy relationships with food through strict fasting protocols. They start to see eating windows as the only time they're allowed to eat, which can spiral into disordered eating patterns. The rigid structure that helps some people can become a prison for others. So here's the bottom line. Your body during fasting switches from burning quick access sugar to tapping into long-term fat storage while simultaneously performing cellular maintenance and adjusting. Some people's bodies make this switch smoothly because of their genetics, lifestyle, or metabolic history, while others struggle because their bodies aren't well adapted to fat burning. The difference isn't willpower or discipline, it's biology. Now, here's what I want to know. Do you think intermittent fasting is genuinely beneficial for most people? Or is it just another diet trend that's been overhyped by people selling courses and supplements? And if you've tried it, did your experience match the hype, or did you end up miserable and hungry all day? Be honest, because the fasting community needs more real talk and less cult-like devotion.